<laughs> I think that was the first thing it got. <laughs> Dude, Morbius is gonna is gonna meme its way into a box office success. Yeah, it's ridiculous. No one should be, no one should be tricked by the memes into going to see the movie. Yeah, it's gonna be like basically Donald Trump, like how you know Donald Trump was only elected because Reddit memed him into power, right? That's, that's what the, I heard. That's what all the the textbooks are gonna say in fifty years. Yeah, they cover the twenty sixteen election. But yeah, I hello can't there, whole section. I can't wait to this whole section on uh, on P-Gate. But yeah, you, you might want to restart that intro. <laughs> hello there, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Tap Calf Transmissions. I, as ever, am your little buddy, Corey, and joining me is Big J. How are you doing today, Justin? Well, I think it's time that we tell the viewers that we are rebranding to the Morbius Movie Hour. Um, the Morbius where... Movie Hour with a limited political discussion thrown in at the start. Every yeah. Time. Every episode, we're going to spend an hour talking about uh, 10 Seconds of Morbius, the uh, full-length feature film f uh, starring vampire Dr. Michael Morbius, PhD, MD. Um, but yeah. Is that who it's starring? Or is uh, that who the no, character it's Jared, is? It's Jared Leto, right? It is Jared Leto. When he's, uh, when he's between cult meetings, he goes and <laughs> plays movie characters for our entertainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, how are you, Corey? You doing well? I I'm great. I finished my Lego Titanic. It is much bigger than I expected. It looks great. I didn't uh, know it came pre-broken up. Like, well, yeah, you build it in sixth, and then you you connect it all together at the end. I thought it was so that you could, because there's a bunch oh. of internal stuff for it. I thought it was Wait. so that you could like easily pull it apart and like show oh, here's the engines because you build the yeah. little engines. They have the propellers attached, and you get all the little yeah. bits in there. But then you seal it all up. So oh. It, but, okay, when you sent it to me, it was in different parts. Like, it was, like, cracked apart because of an iceberg. Is that how it's supposed to be, or is it one big... No, I just wasn't finished building it yet. Oh, okay, I thought... Because, like, when it hit the ocean floor, as you know, it, like, broke in half, kind of like that. Yeah, because the, the back bobbed, and it had that great shot. But, like, no, I if I wanted to... Do, you can't actually put it in that, like, ocean floor wreck mode, where you just pick it up and you drop it on the floor, and then where it mm -hmm. goes, it's... That's, where it goes yeah you and you and dana are really into the the robert ballard role play so the <laughs> titanic in the background is really helpful <laughs> <laughs> all right then uh yeah, so today we're going to be talking about agents of chaos book one heroes trial as well as uh, a couple thoughts a lot to cover. on uh obi-wan episode three i think next week we're probably going to do just an episode straight on uh obi-wan three and four probably Mm -hmm. Unless we're doing Tales of the Jedi. What do you think right now? Make a decision. Yeah, no, I, I think there was a lot of interest. I was checking the numbers and there was a lot of interest in Obi-Wan. So right. Fig yeah, I think figure. three and four. Yeah. So or we four and five or just. Well, next week, it yeah. it's going to be four coming out, right? So, yeah. yeah, we can't we can like say we're talking about five. We won't know what we're talking about. Yeah, but... OK. So are we going to talk about three at all today or just uh, just maybe push off next time? I think uh, we should maybe have a, a brief moment to talk about Corin, our yeah. our Lord and Savior. I give yeah. that episode ten stack poles. Uh, mm -hmm. So Corin's yeah, back. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So there's some mild spoilers. Honestly, if you haven't watched the show, I don't think anything in this discussion will no. really spoil anything for you too badly. Um, but Let's just anyway, stay to the broad strokes of what happened strokes. there, rather than like any plot related elements. So right. And well, I also kind of want to talk about how kind of the fandom has been discovering this because that's also been part of the fun, in my yeah. opinion. Um, so it started off with episode two, uh, and again, broad strokes to avoid. Actually, yeah, broad broad strokes to avoid spoilers. Uh, uh, Kenobi visits a planet, and on that planet, he finds a mother and her child um, trying to secure passage to Corellia. And there's some talk about the child possibly being force sensitive, although for reasons that you'll see when you watch the episode, maybe not. But anyway, in the credits, it's revealed that that child's name is Corin, which is pretty interesting. Now, if it were just a Corellian child named Corin, um, I would think that's probably just an Easter egg. But that was only part one of the mystery. Um, three part mystery so far. Yes, three part mystery. Um, so the next thing is somebody found the IMDb page for the mother. Uh, I can't remember her name uh, in the show. Or Sorry, I can't remember the actress's name. She did a good job, though. I really liked her character. But um, apparently, before the show came out, her 
page was edited or the her role was given as how do you say the mother's name is it i say niche yeah it might be nice it's a star wars name it's made up this it's the same as corin's mom in the eu basically so now we have corin horn we have his mother with the same name which is interesting and making star wars actually who i want to talk about in a few minutes later um put out a post saying that because for those who don't know making star wars seems to have really good connections with this uh, production, they leaked the entire plot like months ago. Um, and it's all kind of being confirmed now. But anyways, they put out a thing saying that they've seen like call sheets and stuff um, where the mother has that name. So it seems likely that that is her name. Uh, and then last episode, do you want to explain how the uh, the plot thickened even further, Corey? So we won't give the context of where this came up, but there was a wall... That had the name Valen Halcyon written on it, mm-hmm. uh, which is the name of Corin's father in uh, in the expanded universe. So mm. all the character names exist. Uh, yeah. Whether that's actually going to be used for anything in the future, or if it was just some uh, neat like story group, here's some things you could use for this stuff, or here's some mm-hmm. references thrown in by someone. Uh, it could go either way there. I'd. It's just, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's just weird that they're, all, it's all kind of coming together, and I will, I, th- I think we'll have a better idea by the end of the season. But yeah, but yeah, like so, Pablo tweeted something kind of indicating that uh, he had something to do with it, and if it was just Pablo who, if it was his idea, um, then most likely it's just it's just kind of a, an easter egg but he kind of talked about i'm not sure whether he was referring directly to making those additions or kind of just some of the little things he's been doing generally um but yeah pretty pretty wild stuff corn could actually be coming back to star wars canon yeah, or coming can, to star wars canon he can be friends with jason sindua mm-hmm. yeah uh but yeah so more important than any of this other news about like Bad Batch probably coming out in the middle of Andor, so we might have doubled up shows, is the yeah. fact that we have both started playing Galaxy of Heroes. Mm-hmm. Uh, how are you yeah. How are you feeling about the Galaxy of Heroes? Pretty good. Um, so I had actually played Galaxy of Heroes when it first came out. Um, I played it for like a few months and I enjoyed it, but I just I fell off for whatever reason. And I wanted to kind of restart my old account. Um, but for those who don't know, Galaxy of Heroes is a, is a mobile game. Uh, but when you start, you're put into what's called a shard, which is essentially like um, it's like a pool of other players who start at the same time as you. And when you play an arena and whatever else, you're putting people with you from your shard. So if I were to start playing now, I'd be playing with people who have been going for like seven years. Um, it doesn't modify that at all. Like it doesn't update that. No, no. it's kind of weird. Your shard, you're in your shard. Um, but yeah, I'm actually I'm actually quite enjoying it. Um, I'm refusing to spend any money on the game whatsoever, yeah. which means that I'll never be like, you know, to be like the top tier. Pretty much most of them are 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 pay to win, uh, and some of them are like, I know a lot of people in the Galaxy of Heroes kind of content creator space because back in the day, um, when I was, at, well, I mean, I'm I'm still a game changer. But back in the day, they used to have lots of Star Wars Galaxy of Hero game changers before they shut that program down. Uh, and there are people who spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the game. Uh, it, it's insane. Yeah, it, I, I'm also never going to spend any money on the game. Like, I, mm. I have no inclination or no notion that I'm ever going to be, like, good mm. or competitive at it. It's just I press buttons sometimes when I'm bored on yeah. the couch now while watching a TV show. yeah. It's like the 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 introductory pack they try to sell you is like $129. $129. And to be fair, it probably saves you like six months, maybe a year of grinding. But like the game is just grinding. What are, you're just fun. saving the gameplay. Yeah, play. exactly. Like that's the fun part for me. Like I've got no kind of reason to want to. Yeah, like that's the well, game. you have a you have a history of gotcha games, though, too, more so than me i've yes. never really been yeah I, I played the dragon ball z one yeah um but but yeah i actually started both of them at the same time but i'm like i have fun with it and yeah it's kind of just something fun to do uh, a lot of people you know it's it's been going on for a long time so yeah it's lots of content i guess but it's cool that they got like the legends characters in there like kyle katarn's in there 
Mara, um, Talon, or Darth Talon, a bunch of Kodor characters and Old Republic characters. I don't know who else. There's lots, though. Yeah, like Death I, Render. it's it's not a great game. Like it's barely a game. It's more of a game than I thought it was, or I thought it was yeah. going to be. But mostly, what it does when I'm playing it is make me want like a, a Star Wars auto chess or a Star yeah. Wars MOBA. So, yeah, yeah, well, you probably would have enjoyed um, Force Arena. That was a really yeah. good game. Um, I I almost certainly would have, but I was yeah I was not paying attention at the time. Rest in peace. Rip. All right. So, do you want to get into? There's one more thing I wanted to <laughs> okay. mention. Before we continue, fine, fine. Throw, throw been, me off. Fine. Yeah, there have been, I'd say, pretty credible rumors that um, Kenobi might be getting a second season, uh, again from making Star Wars. So, what do you? What would you think of that? I I don't know. Like I I've enjoyed Kenobi for what it is so far, but I'm also like I was wondering what they were going to do with it this time, and I'd be wondering even more what they'd do with it in a second season. Like, is it going to yeah. be Force Ghost Kenobi after he's dead, maybe? And then he can see how we explore the nether realms or something? Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't know. Um, I, I feel like... I kind of wish they had maybe made the first season a bit longer. Um, it was like we're halfway through already. And I guess it it is supposed to be a limited series, though. It's just... Yeah. It kind of feels like... It's kind of crazy that it's halfway over. But I guess we'll talk more about this on next episode once we've yeah. seen episode four and we can go fully into spoilers yep all right so we are returning after a few weeks off to njo we've left uh we left off with han being very upset for some reason um mm -hmm. we've we're starting to see a bit of a response in the galaxy to the yuzon vong they're not uh they're not like super yeah. concerned about it as an existential threat yet but they it's starting to make its way around to the, the northern mid rim nearly approaching hut space so it, it is an actual thing that the rest of the galaxy is finally yeah. paying some attention to the new uh, republic's not being annoying <laughs> in this well, one as they, much not as much uh they're yeah. not around as much to be annoying but yeah. this uh i guess this duology by james lucino the agents of chaos books kind of explore what han's going to be up to and his kind of path back to being a functional human dealing yeah. with his his grief a bit we get the introduction of droma the rin who becomes pretty important throughout the njo uh for a couple books and then uh becomes kind of a background figure that does some important stuff but doesn't really get mentioned much anymore and yeah. uh so generally yeah we just see han gets contacted by some old smuggling buddies from the older han solo books there's a ton of references <sighs> to the han solo books which we'll I completely definitely talk forgot about. them. Like, I know we read them this year. We read year some of them. There's, I think, most of the references are to the other ones that we didn't read as well, though. There's I don't a mix. Think so, I think most of them are from the Han Solo, Han Solo adventures. Like the, uh, isn't the guy that he meets up with? Wasn't that from Roa? He's from the books we read. I'm pretty sure. Is Roa from the books we read? I'm pretty sure. Not sure. Uh, but yeah, but yeah anyway, so I, I completely like I'd completely kind of forgotten. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's from Han Solo's Revenge. And OK, we did read that one. So, OK, so but yeah, they have a, a former associate who has gone over to the Peace Brigade. This is where we get introduced to the kind of collaborator elements of the galaxy who are giving over uh, refugees and information to the Yuzon Vong. Uh, so mm -hmm. Han is going to try to hunt them down. We see his adventures through it. And uh, mm -hmm. eventually he he does come out on top of that. But on the other side of it, we get some some of our first looks or first deeper looks into the Yuzon Vong society because uh, there's a lot more scenes with the Yuzon Vong characters, especially Naminor, who's going to become a lot more important as we go along. Mm -hmm. uh, but him and the high priest Harar are in the middle of this plan to give over a priestess named Elan and Vergier. Uh, her familiar, who was also a former Jedi, but no one knows that yet, to the New Republic and kind of infiltrate them, use her to cough in their face and kill all the Jedi. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes horribly wrong. Yeah, and we see the... But it ends up working out kind of awfully for the Yuzhan Vong because their whole plan 
what we're seeing in this book is largely the Vong trying to get them the the kind of fake uh like what what are they called um, deserters yeah yeah so the fake deserters uh into the new republic uh hands which they do and then they kind of stage a variety of things to make it look like for one that the deserters have real information uh like they kind of they launch some poorly timed battles and they get defeated based supposedly on information from them and they also pretend sort of that they're hunting them so like they put up a show they sacrifice a few ships so they give up the the kind of the whole getting the deserter into new republic hands and convincing them that it's legit is fairly costly Mm -hmm. and then multiple warships yeah multiple warships a bunch of and anytime i think about kind of these battles early on and the Yuzhan Vong are very wasteful. Um, yeah. And honestly, that ends up really biting them. They can regrow their ships, but they lose. It's like, it's largely the fact that they run out of warriors at like towards the yeah. end of the war. And, you know, their society kind of falls apart too. But, um, uh, so yeah, at the end though, not only has this plan failed, but Vergier, who is the familiar, uh, of of Elon ends up giving the tears. She, she's got her tears of healing properties and she gives them to Han and Han eventually gives them to Mara and that's kind of the first step of Mara healing that sickness which has been plaguing her for some time now since before the war actually started. Yeah, so Mara's been kind of off to the side being sick so far, but now this is going to be uh, the mm. first little turning point for the New Republic is they get full strength Mary Jade, level up to level 99 in Galaxy of Heroes, ready to kick some Vong ass. It doesn't go that high, but... Sorry. How high does it she's... go? Yeah, 82, I think. But oh, she's got... Number. L- wait till you see the amount of things in Galaxy of Heroes. You can first level up your characters, get their stars up, then you can get their gear up, which goes up to like level 13. Then you can get their mods up. It's, it's crazy. Well, You'll see. So I... This is a very James Lucino book, which normally I like. Mm. Uh, James Lucino is really good for the references, the callbacks, that kind of thing. And normally what I like about it, what I like about it in like Plagueis especially, is that you can read Plagueis and whether you know the references or not, you'll get more out of it, obviously, if you do know them. But you don't feel like I've missed something with those references. But with this, it feels a lot clumsier to me. And like the whole thing, if you don't remember either trilogy of Han Solo books from before that it's just a bunch of references for references sake, mm-hmm. which like it, I, I didn't hate the book, but it was definitely not one of the better new Jedi order or better James Lucino books. In my opinion, I agree with that. Wasn't one of the better James Lucino books, but I've probably enjoyed this one as personally enjoyed this one as much as the other NJO ones. I, I do agree with you though, that, like you d- and and this is coming from us too. Like we're the target audience for James Lucino's yeah. writing because it's very, like you said, referential. But um, we're also we're also people who only recently only read one of the Han Solo trilogies and don't even remember that one very well. So maybe. Sorry, I got to sneeze. Yeah. So did I, get, no, did I catch you, that with my? Uh, yeah, you muted. You muted the nice. Too. Good. Nice. Oh. Well, uh, here he goes. Here he goes again. Okay. But, uh, uh, but yeah, yeah I think so I got the Coombs for me. Like there oh, yeah, was sorry. stuff where I remember. I know the care. I know of the characters like Fiola, yeah. or I know yeah. roughly the references. I know the uh, Galandro, or yeah, Galandro. Uh, yeah. I I know what it's vaguely referring to, but it just felt like almost. I was almost thinking about it like the the stupid Family Guy gags that happen, where it's like, oh yeah. well, that's like my great uncle. Uh, Ramsey Griffin. Galandro on the planet, blah, doing this, yeah. Remember that time we did this thing that's irrelevant to what we're talking about now, but I needed to do the call. It just felt a lot like that, and a lot of them didn't quite land the same. I agree, and I think what kind of makes that a bit kind of more obvious is the fact that the book also contains examples of him doing it really well. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, I really liked, for example, that scene where he's walking through the Falcon and kind of remembering things and like often when characters do that they'll kind of just be remembering things from the movies like oh this is where you know luke got his hand cut off and was recovering which it does do but then it'll also be like and this is where 
I fought Galandro, which is something Han says, which is something that I quite liked. Um, and I also like how, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Kalinda, uh, Belind- Belindy Kalinda, is that her name? Yeah. The, the New Republic Intelligent Agent. Like, I liked her being back. That made yeah. sense. Um, like, and- those, those kind of things make sense. And it doesn't, like, if you didn't read the Krellian trilogy, it doesn't detract yes. from it not knowing who they are. It doesn't feel kind of jarring that they've just stopped in the middle of a conversation to point out mm. that this thing happened before, which is what some of it ends up feeling like. Right. I agree. Um, to- totally agree with that. Uh, there's a lot of, and I mean, a lot of the new Jedi orders kind of like that where they pick one book series to kind of almost like bring to the new era. But it, part of it is the fact that they are kind of, and they're not irrelevant but like they're they're older and you know it's a lot of these things that have been brought up for a long time and they're really brought to the forefront not just as references um so yeah i i I totally agree with you it was really nice though like when he does it well he does it pretty much better than anyone else like yeah like i really like the scene we get to see our young jedi knights again yeah um we get to see mtd like like Lobak is there, he still has MTD. Tenel Ka is there, she's still speaking the exact same way she did in the Young Jedi Knights. Like mm-hmm. I really like that, for example. Yeah, like yeah, I think it still ends up being better than uh, some of the other books that we've rated a bit lower that do it more poorly. Mm-hmm. But it's just like Plagueis as kind of the the shining star example. There is the one that we've. It's probably near the top, if not at the absolute top of our, both of our book rankings right now. Mm-hmm. So if I say it's not as good as that, it's not that it's uh, terrible, just that it's mm-hmm. like it, it, it's a bit jarring. And there are a lot of books that I think are even if uh, like Vector Prime and the uh, the Dark Tide duology aren't quite as high up there. Uh, mm-hmm. There are some other books that are coming later on in the NJO that I think are going to stand out a lot more than James Lucino, even though in a lot of fans' mind, probably James Lucino books, uh, Michael Stackpole, Aaron Alston, those would kind of be the names that you kind of would expect to be the best of what we're getting. I kind of wonder whether make, maybe he had a like particular love for that trilogy and mm-hmm. just didn't see it represented a lot in kind of other work, so wanted to touch on it. Um but yeah, it's like I, I like those books, but I like them more for kind of like they're like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm not thinking about the lore from those stories very much yeah. when I read them. They're just they're adventures like, you know, they're 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 pretty much serials. So it's more about like how they make you feel the action and stuff. Well, I think um, you could still have a lot of the same characters and doing a lot of the same things, but just have the way the characters talk about it or reference it be a little bit mm-hmm. better. Uh, and I, I do think More part inclusive. of it is just that James Lucino wasn't supposed to write any books in this in the series. Like mm-hmm. he was brought in as kind of overseeing the project. And there were others. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was another trilogy that was supposed to be in instead of these two. I might be getting a little bit mixed up on exactly what went on there. But mm-hmm. this was this wasn't part of the original setup. And there was some stuff that was like, I think uh the Dark Tide stuff was supposed to be a trilogy. That got cut down to two books. These mm-hmm. two books weren't supposed to be there, but there was supposed to be a different three books dealing with someone else, and it kind of got added in yep. later. So he ended up having to do a bit different setup than he probably would have if it had been planned a bit earlier. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so still, I, 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 I think he's one of the better writers just overall. Um so, uh, yeah, I, I I think I feel felt maybe a bit warmer about this book than you did. I was definitely a little less bothered. For me, it was more just I was more frustrated at myself because of, like we had read it last year, and I think maybe it was because I think we read them like like each week after week. So I, I think I kind of maybe sped through them a bit more than I would have liked. So I was yeah. I was a bit frustrated at myself for not having kind of the memory that I I wish I did. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember kind of the broad strokes of it, but even soon after we'd uh, we'd read them, like we did our last re-ranking episode. I think we did actually two re-ranking episodes since then, and mm-hmm. even one that was like pretty soon after, we couldn't distinguish between the different books. And then mm-hmm. by the second one, we'd kind of forgotten <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the details. It's funny, like the things that I remember most are like 
the beginning parts. Like the, all the books kind of had the same structure where it starts off and Han and Chewie are like trying some harebrained scheme. Like in one, they're like circus performers. Remember? Um, yeah. Yeah. So with the books, yeah. I definitely want to give, I definitely want to give them another read after this, but yeah. it'll be, it'll be at some point far off in the future. <laughs> I think that might actually have been pre COVID. It might have been. It might have been that. It might long have been ago. like. It might have been like three years ago, mm. but. Uh, yeah. So, do you have any thoughts on our new hero, Mister Droma the Rin? I I don't know how I feel about him. I I always like Droma, um, mm-hmm. but like it feels he feels maybe a bit like, kind of too obvious as like a, a Chewbacca replacement. Yeah. And I'm glad they don't fully go down that route and he doesn't stick around after the series. Uh, like he's not in Legacy of the Force or Fate of the Jedi, at least as, as much as I can remember. Um, so I I like the idea that Han is starting to kind of recover and I like that he's still, you know, thinking of Chewbacca a lot. Uh, I'm liking Droma so far, but it's, I don't know. I, I, I need to see more of the relationship, I guess. Yeah, like I enjoy Droma as a character, but he does have some definite Poochie vibes. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Definite Poochie vibes. Vibes. But yeah. there, one of the things with it is like, uh, it keeps trying to uh, annoy Han with like, oh, he can tell what I'm thinking. And it's basically him finishing Han's sentences and Han getting yeah. pissed off. But some of it, it was like, very obviously, yeah. this is where the sentence is going. And Droma just says the last the last word and Han's like how do you do it how do you know what's in my head yeah I'm going to the kitchen to get a peanut butter sandwich yeah like, that's <gasps> oh my god literally <laughs> yeah I made a note of one of them and it's the one like, within the cafeteria I think yeah I'll, I'll see if I can find it later but yeah yeah I couldn't figure out how tall he's supposed to be because sometimes he's written like he's like a little like um one of the you know those other guys that you, that you talked about in your last uh, glup shadow appreciation yeah the squibs the squibs yeah like is he squib size is he normal size no i, I think they're i think they're in our normal, normal size just like sometimes they like talk about him holding on to like han's leg and like i don't know yeah well they're they're kind of like han falls and like grabs onto him a few times too so there it seems like they uh they talk about their height and body as being like relatively similar Mm -hmm. okay like he comments on chewy's chair being huge but that's Mm -hmm. that's true for anyone that's yeah anyone who's not chewy so do you do you believe that uh that anyone would recognize luke skywalker's name but not leia like especially for a guy who is going to go on to lead a galactic information gathering network is he just pulling han's leg here metaphorically as well as physically. <laughs> I forgot that they that they form like the Rin uh, underground or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I can believe that people would know who Luke Skywalker is. Um, politics are boring. Luke is, you know, Return of the Jedi, you know. But literal um, galactic president of 20 years. Yeah. War hero. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I think of like that scene from The Last Jedi. Um well, like, so many people in the galaxy would have, like, so little, like, the New Republic doesn't impact them, you yeah. know? Like, they probably never get within, like, a sniff of Coruscant. They probably just see them all as, like, big hoity-toity types far away. I think you'd still probably know the name, most likely, but yeah. Luke kind of, I think, transcends that. Yeah, I think of the kid playing with the, uh, playing with the, like, in The, in the Last Jedi, the, the broom boy. Like, he would know who Luke Skywalker is. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't know who Leia was. I guess. But Leia also wasn't 20-year president in that. She leaves the New Republic to run yeah. resistance after being president for, like, one year or something. Yeah. Or not at all. I don't know. Yeah, no, she's, she never gets elected. Let's we'll read Bloodline at some point. What is this? So you can stuff? stop making these dumb mistakes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Oh, the uh, the whole Showalter thing, uh, just wanting like his entire character in this book is wanting to bang Elon. Uh, yeah, Elon's described as attractive a lot. 
and like it, they like they talk about like attractive for a Yuzhan Vong, and then they'll be like, she's got no nose, also. <laughs> <laughs> well, she she's, puts on the the Uglith masker, and he's masker, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I probably would. Maybe I will bang this war prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, Master Chief. Exactly, uh, it's topical. Yeah. Much like the ointment he's going to need afterwards. <laughs> yeah, he's going to need Alpha Blue to figure out what's going on with his Johnson after that. <laughs> we did get an Alpha Blue reference, which was nice as well. It, like, I, that's, again, I really like how... Now, he wasn't a character who had been anything else, right? Like, he was new. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the Alpha Blue stuff in Diff Score, Scar. Yeah, but that that agent in particular, what was his name again? Um, Showalter. Yeah, Showalter. Was he another? Like, I think he's from the Corellian trilogy, wasn't he? Oh, is he? I didn't think so. I but think maybe. he shows up in it. Uh, because okay. like most of that plot is from either the Corellian trilogy or Black Fleet Crisis. There's a lot okay. of Black Fleet Crisis, a lot of Corellian trilogy, a lot of Han Solo adventure stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, I don't think he ends up dying. He gets pretty messed up. Let's see. Yeah, he's in Assault at Salonia, Heroes okay. Trial, and Jedi Eclipse. Oh, okay, interesting. I didn't remember him being in the book, but yeah, he gets he gets shot, and then he's the first one who gets to test out Vergier's tears. Yeah, I I really enjoy Vergier in these early books, especially yeah. like. She's clearly got something going on, and like it's not entirely clear what it is. You get like the hints at the recognition for Anakin, so yeah. I could see going through this the first time and being like, "Okay, who? Oh yeah, totally. what's going on with this?" I mean, at, at this point, like they don't even know what galaxy she's from. Like they don't yeah. know whether she's a Vong kind of creation, whether she's from their galaxy, or whether. And there's even the discussion like we know, and someone I forget who it is, but someone kind of basically predicts what happened. They're like. The Vong have there's evidence they've been here for you know fifty years yeah. before they attacked, and that's pretty much what happened with her. She got kind of yanked by one of the the Vong scouts. Yeah. So, and Droma was able to recognize her species, even if not her in particular. Yeah. So maybe there's little Fosh enclaves in the CSA space. Yeah. I was I was a bit surprised. Like, I would think that like Star Wars is a galaxy with like billions or at least millions of different species um and it says that all the time and like i I don't think she would be that out of place on a regular planet like she's always described as like getting stared at and stuff but like i think if you're in the star wars galaxy and you're going to a space station there's a pretty good chance you're going to see a species you've never seen before yeah she's basically a calibop with reverse knees yeah exactly and i guess less equine but I think the Calabops are like a, an avian horse looking kind of situation, right? Yeah, they're a bit more horsey. And I know that because um, they, uh, what, what's his name? The narrator for the Thrawn duology spends half the book making neighing sounds. <laughs> that might have just been his own, his own flavor <laughs> added in, though. He might, have just, he might have just been feeling it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we get, we also get, like, it's just, we get a reference to the Kam Moss crisis as well in the book. I just, I, I started trying to write down all the references, but at a certain point, it was just too much. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to get all these. <laughs> so this is this is when Han really loses it and doesn't know how Droma is uh, in his thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to say, Roki, you look a lot better than when I saw you last. Han scratched the rectangle of synth flesh Leia had applied to his forehead. The marvel of Bacta. Wish I could. And then Droma completes, say the same for you. <laughs> then Han just like fucking loses it at this. Yeah, you and I, I need to come to an arrangement. Room. I don't know how the trick. I don't know the trick to <laughs> how you do it. But from now on, you're going to keep my thoughts to yourself. Understand? Okay. <laughs> As if wish I could say the same for you is some obscure phrase yeah. that Han was about to invent. And Droma just fucking snags it from him. I do like how I think his his kind of upset is a bit more understandable given the fact that like he's been dealing with Jedi bullshit like all book and kind yeah. of all his life really. Yeah. Where like even I forget which book it is but he he's basically like contemplating the fact that he'll never have the same relationship with his kids as Leia does. Yeah, or even Luke. Which, 
And like yeah. Luke kind of Luke's very shit about it too after the funeral yeah. cuz we do yeah. I guess we we should have mentioned we we open with Chewie's funeral. Oh, yes. The yeah. funeral. I was kind of thinking it was at the end of the <laughs> funeral. And the last book, but no. Well, well they they, they, they end, say they don't know what the to... Wookiees do. Like the there's a theory that they chop up dead Wookiees and put them on branches to get eaten. So it's a funeral. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Well, we we do end the series at Kashyyyk, but I think they're just partying. Spoiler alert, Kashyyyk Unrelated. does survive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the the immediate Solo and Skywalker families are invited. Lando and Mara just can't can't be bothered to make it to the to the funeral. Yeah, Lando's got scratch tickets to scratch. But and Mara's the, just being being a little bit of a baby. Yeah, like walk it off, Mara. <laughs> she's just pregnant. Like she doesn't even have the cooms for anymore. She's just she's just pregnant. Oh, she has the cooms for. <laughs> <laughs> Had yeah. <laughs> Actually, no, yeah, Coombs for yeah. That's a if 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 my wife ever gets pregnant again, that's how I'm gonna break it to my parents and be like, Kelsey is with Coombs for. <laughs> Just call your kids collectively the Coombs spores. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So I don't know where I was going with that anymore. Uh you're talking about the funeral. Yeah. So Han uh he's He's not really been around for his family at all. He's been off gallivanting through pubs, and he he wants to leave again. So Leia, Leia and Han are in a, a tense place in their lives. Mm-hmm. But at the end of this book, at least Han and Anakin are able to have a nice little chat. Uh, that was nice. And they they get back together for a long and happy life with no further drama between the two, and, and that's <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. No, and he he leaves immediately. I, there's some real tension between Han and Leia at this point. Yeah. Um, and one thing I didn't really appreciate from Leia is she's like, I'm not going to be Mala. Like, you can't just come in and out of here when you please. I'm like, Chewie didn't really have a whole lot of freedom. <laughs> like, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't her fault or his fault that he was not Kashyyyk very much. Yeah, it was like he was either babysitting your children or trying to save your life. Yeah, but she could have still said, look, you've got your life debt. I'm not in, I'm not OK with that. We're not getting married. Uh, but like it with their longer lives established later on, like they, they yeah. might've just gotten married earlier, but now it makes it seem like Chewie was maybe five years old during, uh, <laughs> during the empire or something. Yeah. Oh, that's what it was. So, uh, the life that apparently goes multi-generational if, uh, if Chewie yeah. dies before Han. So not just Chewbacca's son, Lumpawaru, uh, mm-hmm. but also Lobaka are about to pledge themselves to Han for the rest of their lives. And Lump rather than Lumpawaru shortening to Lumpy like he does in other places, <laughs> he goes with Waru. So I was just picturing Waru <laughs> and Lobaka following. Oh, yeah, Han. We, we get a Chrysia station mention as well. Yeah. From speaking of Waru. But yeah, and that's also a little bit sketchy because I'm pretty sure the life deck gets extended to who Han's immediate family as well. Yeah. But I guess maybe that's only while he's alive. But it just kind of sounds like, you know, you, you save a Wookiee from a bad day and you got multi-generational <laughs> servants. Yeah, this is not okay. It's like, I'm going to like hire someone to like almost hit Chewbacca as he's crossing the road and like pull him <laughs> back and be like, wow, I sure just did save your life. Now you can get the bathrooms first. Um, then clean into the garage. <laughs> clean in the garage, and I want the deck. I, I don't know if uh, if that's quite how life debts work. I don't think it makes them just work for you in all things. It makes know. them indebted the to protect you. Maybe I don't know. You see episode five. Um, like uh, you, you see. Um, you see, uh, Han's really bossing Chewie around when he's working on the Falcon. But is that just there? Uh, there's definitely an, uh, a not good power dynamic at work here, but I don't think the reason yeah. Chewbacca would fix those things for him would be... like I don't think Han can it. turn around and say, hey, Chewie, uh, go clean the bathroom, and mm-hmm. you have to do this because I saved you once. <laughs> right. Like maybe, maybe it does. Maybe it does. Maybe there's some Wookiees where it's like, I won't get into a gunfight for you, but what I will do is clean that shitter. So yeah, like let me get them shoes. Let me get them shoes shined, baby. 
So we'll we'll see uh we'll see if uh if this ever gets mentioned again because I think it kind of gets dropped. Like I, I forget yeah. how Lobaka and Lumpy don't end up with Han. Yeah, it's just gonna be like you're ruining my life, so <laughs> like <laughs> I'm gonna kill myself if you if you stay around <laughs> with me. Like yeah. I mean, it would have been after what happens to Lobaka. It might have ended up better for him because mm -hmm. he wouldn't have been written out as unceremoniously <laughs> for <laughs> for three books. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like George Lucas definitely wouldn't have liked the idea of like Jedi Chewie hanging around with um <laughs> with Han. So like he might have just had him like outright killed instead of just like banished to the Shadowlands. Well, we thought Gungi was going to be banished to the Shadowlands too, and he's back. So it's true. It's true. You let you 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 can do whatever you want when you buy it from George. Although I thought he didn't like the idea of Wookie generally, Wookie Jedi generally. But he maybe did not. He did. Yeah, but but wasn't he from Clone Wars first? He was. Uh, I think part of it is that uh, he just changed his mind later on too. Mm -hmm. Like a ton of that that happens sometimes with George. He was, and, and he also expected him to be killed by Order sixty six. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was it. <laughs> Yeah, I just imagine George, George Lucas at home. Obviously, he doesn't do this. I'm sure he couldn't give two shits. He's at home watching Star Wars Celebration and like he sees like, I don't know, Mara Jade and just fucking takes whatever <laughs> he's drinking, just smashes it against the wall. That's why his uh, his thank you video was so terse. Oh, did I, he put a thank you video out? It was just like a, a very quick like, oh, thanks for thanks for being <laughs> Star Wars fans. Yeah. He actually, I don't even think he said that. But my my favorite part of celebration had to be watching the Anthony Daniels and Ian McDermott interviews because it was separate. But the mm -hmm. both of them would regularly do a George impersonation, and it was <laughs> never even remotely respectful of what he was saying. <laughs> well, yeah, no, do that. You got a pretty good. Uh, you got a pretty good I got George Lucas to say. impression. He made me stand in the uh, the metal suit on Tunisia. Well, the, <laughs> no water breaks. <laughs> for the Jedi, you gotta. It's it's almost Jordan Peterson. <laughs> yeah, it's like Jordan Peterson hell. just like. <laughs> I'm in hell. <laughs> the rats like. <laughs> oh my god! What was that quote originally from? What was George Peterson or Jordan George Peterson? Oh god. What was Jordan Peterson talking about when he said hell like that? I don't know. He was probably about to cry about people not respecting hell. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was <laughs> and then, it. Then the Jedi can't have sex. It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> Look what they're doing to our young men. <laughs> they have to wear the cloaks because if they wear more revealing clothes, then... <laughs> Notice how the most powerful Jedi is a lobster? <laughs> <laughs> we could learn from them. <laughs> oh, <No>. man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that's the book. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, is there anything else you want to mention? I feel like not a lot actually happens in this book. Like a lot of it is this the space station, the wheel being attacked. Caper. I um, mean, it is very Han Solo adventure style. Like, yeah, that. I enjoyed it for that reason actually. Um, but yeah, it was it was good stuff. Um, so wait, does the does the Jubilee wheel actually still exist, or is it completely? Because it, it almost seems like it was it it survived that. I don't think it actually clears it up whether the station is still up there um, afterwards. Based on the fact that, I mean, all we know is that Han Solo, at one point, Han Solo is able to, like, fly in between it. Yeah. Like, the sections. I imagine it got, like, banged up pretty badly, but I don't think it got fully destroyed. So, because Leia's Leia happens to be on Ord Mantel doing some uh, refugee yeah, evacuation. Course. We didn't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, Han is trying to avoid Leia. He convinces yeah. 3PO to not lie to her, but lie by omission. Uh, by the telling Thrawn him, thing as well, where he, uh, thing? he takes her, he has three PO impersonator. Oh yeah, yeah. To to book his his room on the uh was was that on the Queen of Empire? Or was that somewhere else? Yeah, his it was the Queen of Empire. Yeah, yeah. 
So they will get a lot more of Leia's refugee work. We had a little bit of it in the in the prior books, but that's going to become a big focus mm-hmm. up until at least uh, Yuzan Vong get to Duro. And by then, the Solos are spending a lot more time together. There's a bit of their uh, family drama has cleaned up. That they're at, that's right before Anakin gets killed off. Yeah. So they they're they're not in for a good time. No. I feel, but like, the, I feel like Han takes Anakin's death a lot better than Chewie's, but I don't really yeah. remember. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's partially just that so much more focus is on the twins by then of like how they're coping. Mm-hmm. That Han just Han does kind of shut down again, uh, yeah. and Leia does as well. But it Han already had his, me, his arc. Like, I don't know. I I wish. And it, it, well, I was going to say when it comes to Kylo's death in canon, maybe they can deal this better, but I forgot both the souls are dead. But um, losing your child, like that's a, obviously a life changing thing. Losing two children, like I kind of wish they'd talk more about Anakin and Jason mm-hmm. after they die. I mean, Jason after his death is only really fate of the Jedi. And I guess they do talk about him, but like, I don't know. I wish they talked about Anakin more because, yeah. I mean, part of the thing with Chewie, it's not so much that Han was just reacting to Chewie's death there. He was almost Mm. reacting to, like, everyone around him potentially dying at the same time. So once he processed that, I can see why Anakin's death wouldn't have been... Like, it didn't shut him down in the same way, even if it was Mm -hmm. much harder on him than Chewie in, like, most ways. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, the way he right. gets the way he gets three PO to lie to Leia was promising him that he'll he'll do a backup of three PO in uh, in a in the Google Cloud. Yeah, three PO is dealing with a bit of like an existential crisis in this book, which yeah. is kind of funny. <laughs> um, which, like, I don't know if you're a droid, having your memory backed up in the cloud, like, I don't know, that, that wouldn't do it for me. Like that instance, you're still like that version of you still gonna die, right? Yeah, but it's part of like the the thing we talked about with the original Vector Prime thing, uh, mm-hmm. where there was like the point of view. I think a point of view chap, not chapter, but at least a a little bit of a point of view thing from the droids that were being taken to the pit on Ramamul. Mm. Uh, so it seems like for a lot of these earlier ones, there was going to be more emphasis on the kind of droid element of everything that might have been swapped out for the Shane yeah. ones focus and the Vong internecine conflict later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a moment of that in this book too, where they're watching like um, they're watching kind of a droid slaughter, and I guess that's kind of what sets off three PO's existential crisis as well. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to give your official tap calf ranking for the? I'm gonna guess mine might be higher than you. Uh, maybe not though. I think I'm yours gonna is gonna be lower than mine. Really? I'm giving it a B. Um, okay, never mind. Yeah, I, I'm gonna give it a B. Uh, I liked it. I I liked that it was you know more of the kind of adventure style. I thought it was well written. I liked the references. I really liked the scene where he's walking through the the Falcon. He's like contemplating. Yeah. It didn't really make sense to me that he was thinking about taking the guns out, but whatever. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty cool kind of look through Star Wars history. Um, but yeah, I thought I I'd give it a B. I liked it. Yeah, I am also going B. Usually what happens is like, we'll talk about it. It'll sound like you hate something a lot more than me. <laughs> I like something a lot more than you. And then it's like the opposite in our rankings. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think I still need to add a couple of these to the to the spreadsheet. I don't think I put okay. on Brotherhood, but uh, yeah, so um, double yeah, B's stuff. for us. Yeah. And I will also next week, I'm going to skip the, uh, the Glup Shadow award this week and I'll bring it to next week. I got a, I got an interesting one brewing, I think. Okay. So we're, we're really just banking on a, a few weeks without Glup Shadow because the next one is going to be that great. Well, no, I just wanted more time to research it, honestly. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Well, that, yeah. Like I wasn't, tr- I wasn't purposely trying to save it for, for next week. I just, Right. Yeah. Well, I just want more time. We got a couple questions. I'm busy, uh, okay? No, it's, it's, fine. it's fine. It's fine. Sorry, it's fine. Sorry. It's fine. Yeah. Do you did you find any any reviews or are we just doing the questions? Mm, not any new ones. I'll double check, but I checked I checked last night. I didn't see any. All right. Uh so our first question comes from Hans who says, "Hey, finally got done with basic training and trying to catch up with all the episodes of Tapcalf." Nice. 
My question is, do you think Star Wars could benefit right now by branching off to other genres such as horror or something like a mystery or psychological thriller? I would love to see more Star Wars projects that are purely character focused instead of a grand plot to save the galaxy. I think it would be good if Star Wars could slow down sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we kind of both like the MedStar duology. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that'd be a good idea. Um, I don't have any really specific... Like, I liked... Um, I think we both kind of talked about how we appreciated elements of, uh, like, the military sci-fi that were in Black, Black Fleet Crisis. Crisis. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. It's a big universe. I think there's room to spread yeah. out a bit. <laughs> yeah, and it seems like some of the shows coming up might be in different genre veins. So that's definitely something that I approve of and would definitely like to see more of. Yep. For sure. Fan bots. Uh, yeah. All right. So thank you. Congratulations on finishing basic training. Yeah. And yeah. our next question comes from and two. He says, I've been reading the NJO for the first time and a number of books mentioned that X-Wings with their X with their S foils and cruising position can go really close to the speed of light, which was surprising to me. I think there was a mention of them going about 90% of the speed of light. I was imagining that starfighters could maybe get up to like five to ten percent of the speed of light at maximum velocity. Do you think this max speed is a bit overboard? I find it a little unbelievable that you could be going that fast and still be able to maneuver and see or do anything at all, even without relativistic effects. Also, in the X-wing books, it seems like the max speed wasn't anywhere near light speed. But I could be remembering wrong, or maybe the newer XJ fighters are just that much faster. I am good to see that quote because yeah, that doesn't really seem anything close to reasonable. I think it might be just a difference between like cruising versus fighting speeds and like a lot of those things in Star Wars are just someone says something and then you just go on from it almost. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever the that source seems, says. That does seem ridiculous. I, I agree that seems completely ridiculous though. They definitely wouldn't um, be fighting at those speeds. Like the I think yeah. the fact that it says cruise speeds is they're all is they're out there. Like they're not gonna be mm -hmm. trying to flip around like that. This book, I think, has a good kind of look at the scale of battles. Uh, like Star Wars, it, it's it's this book definitely takes like the X-wing style approach to like the size of battles where they're fighting in really close range, and then the the Yuuzhan Vong ship does like a micro jump several hundred kilometers away. Yeah, which in a real space battle would probably be nothing, considering the fact that you know there's no air, there's no air, like air resistance or anything. You can fire things really quickly but in star wars you know that's far because it's you know they're, they're, they're fighting really close together yeah yeah the that was bill bringy right where the cruisers like jumping around every yeah, few seconds yeah. and causing chaos mm -hmm. they've got the dovin basil swinging them around is that how they were doing it they were using the dovin basil i to think that was interdict the, themselves i think that was the what it was i don't think it was the ship's propulsion doing it. i think it was the dovin basil that was like tossing them around Oh, okay. I, I thought maybe they were using it like an interdictor, like jumping then. But yeah, that makes sense too. Okay, cool. I, I wasn't sure exactly how they did it, so that's that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, and our next question comes from Zach, who asks, I was wondering which Jedi lost their lightsaber the most times, either temporarily or had to actually I make a this new question. one. I, was... I don't know. I can't... I can't really think of anyone who loses it other than Anakin. Um, I think the person who makes the most lightsabers is probably Luke. He gives them away like candy at different points, too. Yeah, he's got the Shoto. He's got his lightsaber, his green lightsaber. Does he make Leia lightsaber? I can't remember. Uh, I think he makes the red one for Leia. Right. Because he so presents that's... it to her in, in the Krellian trilogy. Yeah, so that's like four, right? Well, he doesn't make the blue one, but he makes the green one. He makes his... He makes his Shoto, I think. Yeah. He gives um, he gives Mara Anakin's, right? Anakin's, he, yeah. 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 She's got the blue one. Um because he's using the one that he made in Return of the Jedi, but I feel he, like he maybe at one on one occasion makes one of the kids a lightsaber as well. Yeah. Or makes some temporary ones. So yeah, I think that's probably a good estimate. Where because for a while too, like Luke is the only one with like knowledge of the Jedi arts. Yeah. So yeah, he was probably he was probably making them for a while, but I mean, I imagine it would have to. If if you really want like to 
in universe it'd probably be a really long-lived species like a yoda or someone like that who ended up making the most (laughs) i mean they they've fixed a few retcon issues with saying that yoda had multiple so yeah exactly yeah good Uh, question I, i i can't think of one who routinely loses them other than anakin is like yeah described as not being able to keep his hands on his lightsaber but the weapon is his life don't lose it exactly Thank you, Zach. Our next question comes from Calix, who, up on top of just being great at storing things, says, what is your guys' favorite minor faction? Favorite are you a minor fan of the, faction? Are you a fan of the Tion? Uh, no, not really. Um, I like the... Um, oh, what are they called again? The... Uh, the monks that they visit the ang uh, no not the ang they, that was actually going to be my first answer the bell is it oh the keldor monks that they visit in mm. like fate of the jedi that they're fun um i kind of like the like the this hidden sith as well i don't know if that's like a minor faction but the, the ones, ones from legacy the, like the one sith yeah no yeah true well sith? The, one yeah sith. the ones with like white eyes and stuff from legacy of the force they're yeah. kind of cool uh the csa is kind of interesting they get some kind of they get a bit of they get a bit of lore in this book um but the hapens are probably like they're the probably biggest minor faction yeah in legends and i like the way they're handled yeah i guess a uh, shout out to the Ruvi who pop up a lot more than i think people yeah expect the them to fun. they have a bit more background information there's stuff about how like uh you get more information about like the backroom deals with the empire than you might think and like, mm-hmm. there's even like names of planets that were given to the Sea Ruby, uh, mm-hmm. and they're like how the Empire said that uh, one of the planets was like a, a no-go plague zone, but it was really just because they'd given it to these dinosaurs to suck your soul out, right? And we we get a we get a bit of conversation that confirms, like in other books, they talk about like Sea Ruby space, and this time they actually say specifically it's out of the galaxy, which I liked. Yeah, it's like. They're like the proto Yuzhan Vong because they're they're like star system is like outside the galactic disc, but yeah, it's a little the, the Vong are there. like the Vong are like fully from a far away galaxy. Yeah. Uh, that, at least that's what they're assuming. They talk about that. It's like could it possibly be that they're from this galaxy we just didn't know, or like they're from somewhere close by? And no, it's just like they've got such a big fleet. We also get ship numbers. They say they got like a thousand large ships. Yeah. Um, that's always a tricky prospect, like giving yeah. numbers. That's mm-hmm. always a scary thing. Yeah. Especially uh, where like the Vong haven't fully arrived yet. Yeah. Like Savon Law's fleet's not even there yet, I don't think. Yeah. Because they kind of talk about how he's on his way. Yeah. Like Nash Choka is nearly there, but there's like huge mm-hmm. sections that are still going to be filtering in for, uh, for basically the rest of the series. Yeah. Thank you, Calix. Our next question comes from AJ, who says, as someone who up to this point has only listened to the abridged audiobooks, I was wondering if there was any mention at all in the series of Lumaya and her future plans for Jason. In Legacy of the Force, she reveals that she and Vergier had their sights set on Jason for a long time. Is this talked about at all, or is this a retcon for Vergier? So this is something that is really controversial. A lot of people really don't like the fact that Vergier was turned Sith uh, in a retcon. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah. It's, it is a retcon. Yeah, at this point, Vergier is a very m- mysterious figure. I, I think because I've listened to the most of the truncated versions before, and Vergier's character arc at this point is uh, for this one book, from what I remember, is pretty accurate. Um, yeah, like the the big place where we're probably going to be talking about Vergier and what her actual philosophy is and whether they're whether it makes sense that it aligns with the sith or not or that she would have had dealings with the sith uh Mm -hmm. will probably be traitor like there's going to be a lot of talking about that and then of course how it impacts jason going forward so we're definitely going to have a lot of discussion about uh what does or doesn't work with rajir but yeah but at this point lumaya was not like i say recanonized lumaya came from the marvel comics um and i kind of have described those before as they were almost like how we treat legends now, like mm-hmm. authors would draw from them, but the continuity wasn't really a big thing. Um, Lumaya was kind of just plucked out of there for Legacy of the Force, um, yeah. 
which is kind of cool, but she's not mentioned at all at this point. Actually, yeah. she might get a mention. Does she get a mention? I think she's been Shira mentioned Bree. along with the. Uh, I think she's mentioned by Mera by here with the long Mara lost Mara. or the lost Ooh, loves the of lovers. Luke Skywalker. Yeah, but I think she also shows up somewhere else with that other apprentice person. So I think she's she's been kind of in the background in some places, uh, but yeah, like. like we her there like stuff came out after the fact detailing what she's doing during the Vong War. Yeah. But, but yeah. Yeah. So a lot of Vergier, a lot of Lumaya, a lot of Jason discussion for sure that's gonna be coming up. Mm -hmm. Uh but thank you, AJ. Finally, we have a question from Joel, who says, My question to you is this. Why did the Empire and Legend get so whitewashed in the post Endor era? Was it just the culture of the time, or was it just part of the natural evolution of the post Endor era, starting with Thrawn and making him a less psychotic leader than Darth Vader and the Emperor? I'm always curious why the expanded universe went in this direction for the Empire. So we've talked about that it did get kind of whitewashed, especially with the return of Pelion and everything here, uh, but we haven't really talked about why this might have been the way it went. I think probably honestly because they needed to move away from just the empire being enemies all the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I think like having the empire team up with the good guys is a really kind of good way to show that this new enemy you're fighting is a big deal or yeah. like, yeah, I, I, I think probably just for storytelling purposes. Cause like one thing you also got to consider is that was happening in the nineties. So, Although, you know, the kind of that iteration of the expanded universe had been around for a while and they didn't know kind of what was going to come next in the post Endor era. Like they didn't know if there was going to be movies or whatever. So they kind of just had to keep telling interesting stories without any like there wasn't a first order for them to start writing about. So, yeah, like I think a big part of it as well is that these characters became kind of fan favorite villains and then get to be used in other stuff later on. So like Hellion, Thrawn, and where uh from Timothy's on especially wanting to kind of change Thrawn retroactively into not always having been quite as villainous, but then you have uh like fans get attacked to attached to Pelion and he's gonna be showing up and stuff uh even if it no longer yeah. makes as interesting a story to fight the Empire anymore. So they still want him around. Like if Pelion doesn't exist do they bother really writing in the Empire to this series as much as they did? I don't think so, because it's almost exclusively Pelion, along with mm -hmm. a bit on Jag, but... That's true, uh, yeah, I didn't think about that before, but that's a good point. Yeah, I, I think it's mostly characters and that, like, they didn't get rid of it entirely before, so if they're going to mention it, there it is. Which is weird, because we haven't seen any Talon card yet, and he's like, you know, I think he's got to be more popular than Pelion. And like there, there's plenty of the other societies in Star Wars that are like super fucked up too. Like the Hapens are not really like there's no one that can really be described as a good guy other than like the New Republic is supposed to be presented that way. But even within that, you have like Borsphalia, who's always shown yeah. to be kind of villainous. So it's not quite Warhammer levels of everyone's shit, but it just uh, oh, we need let's have everyone work together against the Vong. We have the Galactic Alliance now and everyone's going to fight each other from within that. Mm -hmm. so yep thank you joel i think that does it for our episode today so next week we are going to be talking about episodes three and four of kenobi in more depth before getting back to agents of chaos 2 the week after that uh and we'll probably have an episode just for the kenobi finale yeah uh, the week after that so we'll We'll go back to alternating between probably Tales of the Jedi and NJO once we've finished with the shows until yeah, we start getting into Andor. Rookie mistake starting Tales of the Jedi, and then it's going to be like six weeks until, or well, three or four weeks until. Well, we kind of knew we'd be going the different arcs separately. A lot of them yeah, aren't that's like true. the most. Connected, that's true. But... That's true. All right. So any big fancy stuff coming up for you? Uh, we got the Rangers game tonight. Uh, hoping they win. A little bit scared. Not super confident. Been really into the NHL playoffs. Um, sad that they're kind of over halfway over, but yeah, other than that, not really. How about yourself? Uh, this Sunday, we've got the Thrawn's Revenge 16th anniversary stream at 3.30 Eastern. Doing insane. fancy stuff. 
So that'll be fun. That'll be on Corey Loses. So check that out if you want to see Empire or Mod 